Welcome to the debate at Geo8 podcast series exploring issues and research affecting the Group of Eight universities and by extension Australia's economy and our society. My name's Ron Candelars, I'm a freelance journalist and producer, and throughout this series we've been canvassing a range of topics touching upon the work of all the Group of Eight universities. They include the Australian National University, Monash University, UNSW Sydney, the Universities of Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Queensland and Western Australia. In the studio with me is Vicky Thompson, the CEO of the Group of Eight Universities, and joining us online is Stephen Loosley, former Senator in the Australian Parliament during the Hawke-Keating governments where he chaired both the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade and the Senate Regulations Committee. He's a businessman, former politician, defence and foreign affairs expert, trade expert and board member on the European Australian Business Council. Well, Stephen Loosely, we're both regular readers of your many newspaper columns and a regular theme seems to be the increasingly fragile nature of Western democracies and what that means for international geopolitics. Are you optimistic for the future or pessimistic? Uh, having been a member of the Australian Labor Party for 52 years, I can only describe myself as an optimist. Uh, and I'm optimistic about the state of uh, American democracy, particularly in the light of the congressional midterms just a week or so ago, and optimistic about what has happened in a number of other countries where the tide of populism has been rolled back. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Boris Johnson. Uh, Losing the prime ministership in uh, in the UK, Joe Bolsonaro in Brazil, and so on and and so forth. I, I'm optimistic, but that doesn't mean to say there is any room for complacency. Uh, uh, democracy dies as a consequence of uh, of complacency and a failure to uh, to tend the plant. You mentioned. The, the results in America just recently, and we've seen what appears to be a poor result for the you know the the, the Trump uh, section of American politics more generally. Do you see that as a as a potentially a bit of a turning point, or is that wishful thinking on behalf of uh, progressive minded people? It's definitely a turning point, and not only for uh, uh, progressives in the the classic sense, be they Democrats or Independents in the U.S. It's also a turning point the moderates uh, amongst the Republican constituency. The New York Times did a, an assessment just recently, just a few days ago, about how much of a burden uh, Donald Trump was in an endorsement. And Trump endorsed quite a few Trump and Z candidates uh, for various uh, offices. And in some crucial races, uh, for example, particularly the Senate in Pennsylvania with Dr. Oz. They lost. Now, the Times estimates that there was a 5% gap between mainstream Republican candidates, most of whom were elected to uh, office, for example, as secretaries of state, and Trump backed candidates who failed, particularly in the Secretary of State uh, uh, polls. So I think we can say turning point has definitely been reached in the United States. Trump will spend the next year or so trashing alternatives in his own party and bemoaning the fate of America. It's fascinating that his speech at Mar-a-Lago announcing his candidacy for 2024 sounded remarkably like the speech that he made prior to the 2016 election. And this is after he's had four years in the White House supposedly to address the problems uh, that he maintains are, uh, are so injurious to American uh, life. I think we have seen the worst of the uh, the Trump fever in American uh, politics, and it will probably settle down in the aftermath of the 2024 election, regardless of who is successful at the polls. Where do you think uh, Australia fits in all of this? Given your foreign affairs experience, uh, you know, your, your, your understanding of defence and international relations, where do you think Australia sits as a middle power in this changing geopolitical environment? Uh, there are definitely challenges for us. There's no question uh, about that. Our uh, circumstances in geostrategic terms uh, have been difficult over recent years to the extent that we've not seen these kinds of threats that have emerged in the region since 1945. I agree with Richard Miles, the, the Defence Minister, the other night, talking about our strategic circumstances. 
But I think we've responded effectively. And uh, in, in terms of working through uh, issues uh, with the United States, strengthening ANZUS, for example, making it certain that the Quad emerges as an effective partnership with the US, Japan, and, uh, and India, and we can build further uh, on that. And looking at AUKUS in terms of military uh, technologies for the future, submarines attract the headlines, but artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and the like may turn out to be even more uh, important to our security in the, of the longer term. I think we've responded uh, uh, effectively in the summary in which Prime Minister Albanese uh, has been engaged uh, uh, just recently, I think underlines that. It's been successful in terms of uh, relations with, uh, with ASEAN, uh, with the G20, and, uh, and most recently with APEC. And President Xi Jinping, agreeing to a, a meeting with the Australian Prime Minister, is a, a, a signal that Beijing understands that the, the politics of intimidation and threat simply haven't worked in the Australian uh, context. And the Chinese consistently ask Australia for a reset in the relationship. The Australian response is uh, we require a stabilisation first before we consider reset, and that begins with the removal of the tariffs and other sanctions upon Australian uh, goods. So I think our diplomacy has been effective. Our relations with allies and partners has been effective. Uh, we can build further on that. At the moment, the challenges are there, but I think we've addressed them uh, in reasonably robust terms. I was uh, uh, just uh, in London a few weeks ago at a NATO-oriented conference and how we deter war in the 21st century. And the Japanese delegate and I, without breaking the confidence of the meeting, consistently argued for an approach with NATO plus in focus, that is looking at Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, as well as the, the NATO countries, which is accepted. And uh, we saw in Madrid, the NATO uh, powers inviting uh, representation from Australia, from Japan and other Indo-Pacific countries. And I think that's a, a sign that there's a global response uh, to the challenges emerging from dictatorships, particularly from Russia uh, in Ukraine and from China in the uh, East China Sea and the, the South China Sea, and from, from some of these dumpster despotisms uh, uh, like the Iranians with their export of the weapons of, uh, uh, of war. So optimistic, but no room for complacency. I note there was commentary actually just very recently about AUKUS and bringing in Japan into that, that context as well, beyond the quad relationship. How do you think that would play out? I think the closer the relationship between Australia and Japan, the better it's in uh, Japan's interests and Australia's interests. And we are very close on a lot of issues. If you look at the recent meeting between the Japanese and Australian prime ministers in Perth and the communique that was uh, issued, it is very close to the language of ANZUS uh, itself. In terms of bringing uh, Japan into AUKUS on the basis of the technologies that are being developed, there's a very powerful argument uh, uh, for that. But I think the principle, Vicky, is this. The closer the relationship, not only in military and security terms, but in terms of the economic embrace that we've had since 1957, the close cultural links that we've had, and that essential relationship of trust between Canberra and Tokyo really does take us a long way down the path to uh, enhance security. You mentioned a couple of times there, AUKUS. What's your view about AUKUS and the procurement of nuclear subs? Because what you've said thus far seems to jar with um, some of the statements made by one of your earlier bosses, Paul Keating. Well, Paul has a particular view on uh, uh, these issues. I love him dearly and I agree with him on most things, but I disagree with him on this. Now, I need to be careful as on the the deputy chair of TALUS Australia New Zealand and the uh, the parent company in Paris has a stake in Val, the, the French submarine maker. So let me just say that we need to have the very uh, best capability for the Australian Defence Force and the closest relations with allies and partners, the US and the UK. But I think the previous government uh, could have handled the decision better. 
with a greater degree of uh, sophistication, which would have avoided some of the clumsiness to which President Biden referred. Do you, just just getting back to the Paul Keating thing, though. Um, do you think Paul's Keating is wrong when he comes to his views on on where we sit with China? I've known uh, Paul for forty odd years, and I understand it's probably not a good idea to critique his. Uh, <laughs> Opinions. You, you generally are met with a flamethrower, a verbal <laughs> flamethrower, and I've always learned to stand behind him in that uh, circumstance. Look, he has a particular uh, a view on the on, on the relationship with China, which is much more optimistic about uh, the, the the good intentions of the Chinese Communist Party as as he sees them. I don't share that view. You have a passion for military history and a great understanding of the the great historical and social forces that have helped shape the current geopolitical environment. Some commentators point to this decline of America and the rise of China as inevitable. Do you agree? Nothing's inevitable in politics or uh, or life. We saw that uh, in Tuesday in the United States where the commentators were saying, well, it would be a, a red wave that Republicans would sweep the Democrats away and the House take the Senators as well, and Joe Biden would be a lame duck. Now, to date, none of that has uh, has happened. So uh, inevitability is not a word uh, to be used. In the same way, some uh, political leaders are written off as uh, impossible uh, to elect. They will never be elected. And in my lifetime, I've seen people as uh, as different as John Howard and Paul Keating, Jeffrey Kennett and Bob Carr, so described, and they all won and they, they won handsome uh, victories. China's rise is to be welcomed in, in terms of lifting tens of millions of people out of poverty uh, and hopefully China becoming a, a responsible player on the global stage. And that... that uh, was certainly hoped earlier this uh, this century. Now, uh, the United States was described by a French socialist, Hubert Vertrain, at the beginning of this century as the hyperpower. It is no longer seen as the hyperpower. It is seen as having relatively dec- declined in respect of Chinese growth uh, across the, uh, uh, the board and the emergence of perhaps a more multipolar world. But the US still remains uh, first among equals in terms of its capacity to project power, in terms of its technologies, in terms of uh, its economic uh, strength. The the key is to uh, enable China to rise peacefully, to contribute not only to the region but to the globe, while having the United States continue to be particularly purposeful in uh, in guaranteeing the peace well, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but more broadly. What's really interesting about uh, the war in Ukraine is that the United States has again emerged in Franklin Roosevelt's terms as the arsenal of democracy. Now, it's had some partners uh, carry the water too here, uh, Britain in particular of more recent times, the Germans. But the US has been the arsenal of democracy again that's guaranteed the sovereignty of Ukraine by giving very brave Ukrainian troops in the field, the, the weapons and the wherewithal that they need to resist Russian aggression. So it's it's one of those circumstances uh, where uh, uh, history is tending to repeat itself, not not always in, in Marx's terms as first as, uh, as tragedy, then as fast. And we see certain elements of that in Ukraine. But the US re-emerging as the arsenal of democracy is, uh, is, is quite extraordinary in uh, in this decade of the 21st century. Well, let's we talk about the various streams of history. Some analysts have referred to the Thucydides trap, named after the historian who wrote about the, the clash of Athens and Sparta and the Peloponnesian Wars. And it says that a rising power challenges the dominance of an established power. That dominant power is likely to respond with violence. So you, do you disagree with that? It's likely, but it is not inevitable. And there are various ways to work these uh, issues through. I mean, the clash between the various Greek cities need not be reflected uh, a couple of thousands of years later uh, in, uh, in 
Point Human taken. Point <laughs> right. But he's talking. He's I, talking about a general theme, though, in in international politics, though. Yes, but in my younger days, I thought that uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels had discovered the laws of history. I was wrong. <laughs> so I'm not sure that Thucydides uh, is applicable in this particular circumstance. Um, we are capable of having negotiations that bear fruit. For example, uh, who would have thought in the middle of the 1980s in the last century that the Soviet Union would disappear five years later and that we'd have an end to the first Cold War? Now, we were probably in the West too triumphal in that uh, time as the Soviet Union disappeared. Before we knew it, we were in a second Cold War when the Russians uh, uh, absorbed Crimea, were particularly aggressive in uh, in Eastern Europe, just as uh, Beijing moved from being assertive to aggressive uh, in this part of the world. These situations are not inevitable. Putin then misreads the preparedness of the West to defend our, uh, our values. Did Xi misread the West in terms of Taiwan? Well, perhaps, but we haven't seen the kind of reckless behaviour that the Russians have displayed uh, in Ukraine. We haven't seen an effort to uh, to mount a cross-straits invasion or lock uh, Taiwan down with, uh, with air and sea uh, declarations uh, uh, by China of, uh, of control. So there's always room to negotiate. And the fact that President Biden and President Xi had a three-hour meeting the other day is a, is a positive sign. I've always agreed with Winston Churchill. Far better to jaw jaw than to war war. You have a, a, a good understanding of universities more generally. You're a visiting fellow of the US Studies Centre at Sydney University, so you're well versed in the world of universities. I want to ask you, in this uh, podcast series, we've often talked about the role of higher education when it comes to soft diplomacy. Do you see the universities playing an important role in this regard in some of the, the issues that we've just spoken about? Oh, yes, uh, and a greater role. And Australian universities have the capacity to play a greater role. Uh, Vicky mentioned this to me the other day, and I was just thinking it through. In terms of what emerges from Ukraine after there is a peace settlement of sorts, and there will be a peace settlement of sorts, it might be months or a year down the track, but it will come. So we're going to have a series of Ukrainian universities that have been damaged, perhaps very badly, in the uh, in the warfare that the Russians have unleashed. Why wouldn't Australian universities be in the foreground of helping to rebuild, not only in terms of the bricks and mortar, but in terms of the, the courses right across the, the board, be it medicine or, uh, or philosophy? Uh, why wouldn't Australian universities be in the foreground of having Ukrainian students welcomed into our, uh, our lecture halls and uh, and tutorials and uh, helping a new uh, cadre of uh, intellectuals in Ukraine who can serve uh, their people and who can take Ukraine to the world. I mean, I think that's something that Australian universities would be well advised to start thinking about now. I can tell you we are thinking about it. We're definitely thinking about it, Stephen. And in fact, it was a meeting that we had through the EABC, the European Australian Business Council, with the Ukrainian ambassador to Australia several months ago now, actually, where he actually talked about we need to build, we need to be doing the rebuilding while Mm. we're fighting. And, and those words really stuck with me in terms of, well, what can we do as universities apart from obviously offering uh, some moral support to the thousands of scientists and researchers who've been displaced and universities which, you know, literally have been destroyed. And so certainly from our perspective, from the Group of Eight's perspective, that's something that we are looking at in terms of what support we can offer. And it's always strikes me as just... It's very heartwarming, actually, that we seem to be, you know, Australia is so far away from everything, but we still have a capacity to have such a huge impact mm. in Ukraine, yeah. you know, in this case or in other areas that, it, it, you know, histo- history will show that. And I think that is true for our international education and research piece as well, not just in our region, but globally we have the capacity to use the soft diplomacy of educating hundreds of thousands of students 
and doing global research with global partners, and we've talked about that with preeminent researchers in the past, and taking they then take out from us, mm. from Australia, our, our way of life, our learnings, our thinking, and that has to have a positive influence. So I think we are picking that up, Stephen, and that's a result of the European-Australian Business Council dialogue we had with the Israeli ambassador. Of which but- you're a board member, right, right Stephen? Yes, I am. I'm very pleased to play a modest role. Yeah, so, and and we saw in years previous where the Morrison government seemed to have, you know, a a particular view about Chinese students and the uh, dangers thereof and all that sort of thing, and and it it was a very testy relationship. Do you think that with the new government, with the Albanese government, we're getting a rethink on on how universities can play a role with with their student populations more generally with soft diplomacy, developing relationships between countries? I, I believe so, and I've known uh, Jason Clare, the education minister, for decades. He's a very decent individual, a very thoughtful individual. I, I make no criticism of his immediate predecessors on the coalition side, but there's no question that some in the previous government simply saw Australian universities having a target on them and wanting to score points that they thought would uh, assist them electorally uh, domestically. Now, I think that is gone. I don't uh, detect that, uh, though you see a fairly constant diet of stories about uh, alleged woke excesses on university campuses and so on. I mean, I think we just have to be more confident in the sector. There was a a former American ambassador, a a very decent individual, A.B. Culverhouse, who said that he thought the United States had more confidence in Australia than Australians had in ourselves. That's probably true, and it applies in the university sector as in so many other sectors of our, uh, our, our public life. So what uh, Vicky's talking about is, is great news. Uh, let's see that through and see how we contribute in the, in the rebuild, and it's an exercise in Australian soft power, but it's an assertion of our preparedness as a democracy to do the right thing for people who've uh, who've really stood up to defend the fledgling democracy in Ukraine, we mentioned there the the Albanese government. You you recently compared the early days of the Albanese government to the first days of the Whitlam government. What did you mean? It was um, topical in the sense that it was uh, not long after it was revealed that Scott Morrison, for uh, very odd reasons, had had himself sworn in uh, by the Governor General to a number of of portfolios without uh, telling the existing ministers or the cabinet or the parliament or indeed the Australian people what he was doing. I was surprised that he hadn't actually had himself sworn in as governor general. It would have cut out (laughs) a little bit easier. (laughs) Uh, And and very odd behaviour. And I remembered that when the Whitlam government was elected December 2nd, 1972, Gough Whitlam and his, his deputy, the deputy PM, Lance Barnard, uh, had themselves sworn in and covering all the portfolios in the uh, in the new government. But they told everybody it was, was made public. And they then proceeded to say, uh, this is our platform. This is the Federal Labor platform. This was our manifesto. This is what we campaigned on. We have a mandate and we're going to implement. And they did. And so some of the newspapers, uh, the Herald, the Age, the Australian and so on, as I recall, had a box on the front page every day for the first couple of weeks after the Labor government was elected saying, words to this effect, this is what the government did yesterday with a list of decisions that Whitlam and Barnard had taken. And those decisions stood the the test of time. And I thought that was the best example of a translation by federal Labor from opposition to government that I could recall. I thought it was better than the Fork translation, that was very good, Uh, certainly better than the the Rudd translation, a little bit of stumbling there. And I thought, Mr Albanese and company have done at least as well as this. And that's what I meant. Uh, You can do a lot of things in politics if you're open about it. Yeah. Uh, If you try and cover things up, you are going to be caught and generally humiliated. And I think so that has think, been a, yeah. an early hallmark, actually, of the government, um, even from the perspective you, you mentioned, Ron, the kind of the, 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 the constant tension that there was with the previous government, but also just transparency. I mean, they haven't 
overpromised <laughs> on anything. In fact, I'm talking about our sector here. They've been very upfront with us. We've just had the announcement of a, uh, an accord process for the university sector, a major review. It'll be really the first major review since the Dawkins reforms in the 80s. But the expectation management is real and the minister has said this is not necessarily, well, it will be about money in the end, but but that's not our starting point. It's about is this system fit for purpose mm-hmm. and what do we need to do to shift it? And then we'll look at the funding side. And so I think it's incumbent upon us as a sector and others, and in fact there are business people on the on the panel that will that will lead that accord, to be very bold with the sorts of things that we think we want because the Dawkins era was fit for purpose for that period. But he will say now, and he has said this to me, he didn't think that that reform would last 40 years. You know, we haven't had s- significant reform in our sector. And, of course, we're far more externally facing. We're very internationalised. We weren't as internationalised 40 years ago to that point. I don't think we'd even be having a discussion 40 years ago about whether universities could help rebuild Ukrainian uh, universities, for example. So that's just one example of how different we are now and how broad our scope is. Yeah. Um, it's suppose- an interesting feature of our history, Vicky, that the temporary becomes permanent. I remember the, the Dawkins reforms. I remember IOP national conferences. I supported Joe Dawkins at the uh, at the time, but I th- always remember Parliament House Canberra of 1927 was still Parliament House Canberra in 1988, mm. even though it was supposed to be a temporary building. We, we seem to have embraced the idea that uh, once we've done something, well, we say, okay, get on with it. Talk Richard down. Miles actually said that about the defence budget the other night at the Sydney Institute uh, dinner. You have to inject into the process a, a, a quality control, not just say, here's your budget, get on with it. Um, so I'm pleased about the review in the, in the tertiary sector. Mm. So how do you think the Albanese government is performing overall? When you made that, that comparison between Whitlam and Albanese, I, I had in mind also... That, that the Albanese government has come into, into power at a time when there are big economic uh, issues at play, a difficult uh, international environment, inflation, et cetera. Uh, some of these things were the same things that Whitlam had to face at that time, but, but the Albanese government seems to have hit the ground running. It has, and, uh, and Jim Chalmers, as the Treasurer, has been very, very sure-footed, and uh, he doesn't uh, overcommit. And he doesn't talk in terms of uh, instant results, and this helps. So, look, Goff did confront the the oil crisis and uh, and other international developments. He had the most difficult early period since Jimmy Scullin became PM on the eve of the the Great Depression, and the Labor government of the Whitlam era showed uh, its weaknesses because we had been so long out of power. Now, the the beauty of the Albanese government is that we have people who are, were familiar with the Hawke-Keating uh, era, understand how government works, perhaps from within the parliamentary uh, circumstance or uh, another situation they've been involved in working with government. And I think that is showing at the moment. It's uh, It's very deliberate as an administration, and uh, it's determined in Neville Rand's classic uh, observation to stay there. Neville always used to say that was the first decision of a Labor government, stay there. And you can do a lot when you're in power over a decade or so. So there are similarities in relation to those two governments, but but it is a very different Australian political scene with the, the Greens more prominent. We've seen the rise of the Teals. How do you see Australian politics changing in the years ahead? Uh, what are the emerging trends that you see in the future? It's uh, a circumstance where the, the Teals have emerged as a essentially an offshoot of the Liberal Party. If you look at the, the Teal candidates who are successful, and there's some very able uh, people numbered uh, amongst them, most of them should have been the endorsed Liberal candidates for those seats, uh, but uh, they were not, and the electorate reacted accordingly. Now, some of that is a uh, response to Scott Morrison's essential boganisation of the uh, of the coalition, of walking around the parliament carrying a lump of coal and 
and this sort of nonsense. And there's a factor in Australian politics that a- applies on both sides of the aisle. That is, if you dodge a bullet as a government at one election, you will cop a shotgun blast at the next. Now, that certainly happened to the Keating government, winning in 1993 when it was expected to lose and being blasted in 1996 as Wayne Goss's memorable memorable, uh, observation that people in Brisbane were waiting with baseball bats for Wayne Swan and Kevin Rudd. Actually, they were waiting for Paul at the time. So Morrison wins an unexpected result uh, three years ago and is blasted uh, at the uh, at the next poll. It, there is a, a continuing focus on candidates rather than parties. In the United States, it's now a circumstance where in most polling, people are 30% identified as Democrats, 30% as Republicans, 40 as independents. And that's what's happening in Australia, in both the House and in the Senate. And that's likely to be reinforced, I suspect, at a state level in both Victoria and New South Wales, where elections are uh, are very much either immediate or on the horizon. And people are focused upon candidates and issues rather than the, the general cultural embrace of a political party. So how does that work then for, you know, a workable government in future. Did, are, you, are you optimistic about that in the long term? I I am. I mean, I've always said Chris Bowen is forever quoting John Curtin on this, and he, he's right, Labor governs alone or not at all. The commentary of the right calls the government in Canberra a Labor Greens coalition. It's not. Uh, Labor can work with a coalition, uh, the Liberal and the National Parties, on certain occasions, as it have demonstrated Mark Dreyfus talking to the coalition about the National Integrity Commission can work with the Teals, can work with other independents such as uh, uh, such as Bob Catter, and with the Greens when necessary in the uh, in the Senate. But Labor has got to demonstrate fundamental commitments and fundamental beliefs in order to be able to negotiate and and when necessary to amend and to the trade. Exactly the same with the coalition, Peter Dutton will find this. Uh, so I, I think we have a circumstance in which there will need to be a greater flexibility in our system of government and a greater preparedness in the uh, in the parliament to see things in terms of what may be achieved rather than uh, what uh, a particular party platform lays down. Stephen Loosley, thanks very much for your time. Time is against us now, but it's been an all-encompassing chat about many things, including Thucydides. Um, Thank you for your insights. It's been wonderful. Ron, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your company today. If you'd like more information about the issues raised in this podcast or other related topics, please visit our website go8.edu.au. And a quick reminder that you can always tune in to Debate at Go8 on Spotify, Google, Apple or YouTube. Bye for now.